just for a moment. Just impress, pray healing over you. I don't know what you may be facing, what trial you may be in, what suffering you may be enduring. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to urge you to persevere. Be steadfast and movable in Christ. James says in James chapter 5, Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Father, I pray and I believe your word. Prayer is effective and it's powerful. So, Father, I pray for the person here that is suffering with an illness or sickness. Maybe it's hidden. Father, you know. And so, God, I ask in faith that you would heal them. But for that person, I would ask that you would increase their faith even if their healing doesn't come here in this earth. Ultimate healing will come one day in Jesus. I pray for the brokenhearted. God, I pray that you would mend their heart in Christ Jesus, that they would, as Paul says, that you have supplied all our needs in Christ Jesus. And what we need more of is your grace and your mercy. Now, Father, would you give us a heart for those outside of this church who are suffering and hurting? Would we right now bring them to memory and that we would bring them before your throne? And we would ask you to heal them. God, for the lost, we ask that they would find healing in Jesus, salvation, ultimate healing. God, because the reality is we have a limited time to make a maximum impact. And so, Father, help us to live with the long view in mind. So, Lord, I pray that you be big. May Jesus be glorified and worshiped. In everything that we say, Lord, would you be with me as I present your word? I am inadequate, powerless, and unable to do any of this without your help. And so, Lord, would you go before me? We pray this in all things in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. 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 You turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. That's where we we will land today. Uh, before we get, begin, uh, I, I want to address the elephant in the room. Wait, Garrett, we beat the elephant last night. <laughs> but you know, but you know, I, our mission statement literally says we want to make much of Jesus, so that's what I want to do up here. Um, but you, you can come find me afterwards, and we'll talk. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be in verses 12 through 18. And, um, uh, you know, I was talking with Garen about this passage. And, I mean, the whole book of Philippians, as we have, what we're trying to do with you is we want to take a deep dive into defiant joy, uh, what that should look like in our life as a Christian. We, man, we we have, we have been blessed uh, more than we deserve in Christ. Amen. I mean, the grace of God is beyond anything we deserve. And so when we live with that in view, it gives us this joy that is defiant. It, it surpasses just anything. I mean, any circumstance we may be in, it, it, is, it supersedes that in life. And I don't know if you've heard the song on the radio, um, I'm So Blessed by Cain. Uh, it's my little girl, she loves singing that song. Um, Rachel came to me one day in church. She said, what is that song, I'm So Blessed? And I was like, Emma sang it, didn't she, in class? Um, but it's just, it's a catchy tune, and, um, and so as we think about we are so blessed, we're just so blessed in Christ, and it gives us this defiant joy to face the, the difficulties and the hardships of life, and that's what, that's the backdrop of Philippians. Paul is in an inner Roman prison, and he's, he, is, he is talking and writing to this church, 
about joy. And so we, we, we recognize, remember, Paul's joy wasn't rooted in the here and now. It wasn't rooted in his circumstances. It was rooted in a resurrected Savior. Right, so, so when that's our goal, it doesn't matter what we may be facing or the hardships we may be in. Right, we, it, joy is possible because joy as a Christian is a choice. It's always a choice that we make. And so we, we've seen how, how Paul is just enduring hardship with great joy. He says, I rejoice, and he says, and I will rejoice. Uh, Pastor Garen did a great job just breaking down uh, last week, chapter 2, uh, what most people know it as the the. Christ him, where we see Jesus humbling himself. He, he is the model servant. And so, but Paul is with a defiant joy. He says, as we have, we're rejoicing people, we should do that in unison together, in unity, in the body of Christ. And remember, the foundation for our unity is humility, right? a humble heart. And where do we get that from? We get that from looking at how Jesus emptied himself and took it, taken on the form of a servant. And being obedient, even obedient to the point of death on the cross. And so Jesus is, is that example. And so today Paul is going to say, in, in light of that, he's going to start this section off with the word therefore. So in, in light of what we just seen in Jesus, in light of the hymn that we just saw, he says, he's setting the tone for us. He says, because of Jesus' example, Right? We should live a life that reflects that humble service. So he's going to get real practical here. And so what he's going to tell us today is that through God's grace, we are to persevere in our obedience to Christ through working out the salvation that God is working in us. Persevere in the faith. Be steadfast. Right? Persevere. Times are hard. Times are difficult. Right? But we, we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, what Hebrews 12 tells us. And so we persevere, right? We're we're steadfast in Jesus. And so Paul is going to call them to perseverance, right? But he's going to call them not to passivity. The Christian journey, we're not just passive as we grow and follow Christ. We're actively persevering and living out what, what God is working in us. We are working out what he is working inside of us. And so uh, John Newton gives this illustration of perseverance and keeping your eye on the goal the long term. And he says, suppose a man was going to New York to take possession of a large estate. Uh, I like how he says, and his carriage. We don't really drive carriages, but I have a van, so we could say that's a carriage. Um, let's just say, in his van should break down a mile before he got to the city, which obliged him to walk the rest of the way. What a fool we should think of him if we saw him wringing his hands and blubbering out all the remaining mile. My carriage is broken. My carriage is broken. You just got one more mile, man. And you just persevere. Keep your eyes on, on the goal. Right? And then Paul's going to give us an extremely hard command because it's hard for me. He's going to say, do everything. Persevere in life, in the hardships of life, in, in the trials of life. Keeping your eye on the goal. He's going to say, and do it all without grumbling. It's difficult. Do it all without complaining. Without complaining or arguing, he's going to say. So read with me in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. So I want you to listen to some connections that Paul is going to make about our Christian journey that we know is discipleship. He's going to make some connections about Christian discipleship, right? Persevering in our faith, working out what God is working in. So he says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Therefore, so in light of uh, Jesus' humble example, My dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, should work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. So that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, he says, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. 
In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. And so Paul here is making us, he's giving us some connections to Christian discipleship in this passage. What is it, as we, as we have faith in Christ, right, we have salvation. This is, he's talking about, remember we've, we've discussed this before, sanctification, right? It's the ongoing work, the process of the Holy Spirit working inside of us and changing us and making us more like Christ, right? That's sanctification. That's what Paul is talking about. So he says, discipleship. So he gives us a connections. So as we place faith in Christ and as we humble ourselves and see Christ humbling himself, what should be the, the practical outer working of that in our life? So the three connections he's going to make. The first connection is he connects God's work and our work. God's work and our work. Right? Because he says in verse 12, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence but even more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So we see both our work and we also see God's work in this passage. But here's, here's what I'll, I want to make note real quick. See, Paul was such a caring servant. He's kind of like a caring shepherd of the flock, a caring pastor you can view Paul as. You see, Paul is commending the Philippians for their obedience. What does he say? Just as you have always obeyed. And then he commands them to persevere in their obedience. So he's encouraging them. He's saying, look, guys, you, you are obeying. You're persevering. Keep going, he's saying. Such a caring pastor. He says, so we too should find encouragement and motivation here, I think. We should find motivation in here. Because here's, here's the reality. If, if you find yourself growing in Christ-likeness, realize that it's an evidence of God's grace in your life. This means that you celebrate any spiritual progress towards Christ-likeness because of God's enabling grace in you. Any. Like if you see any growth, I mean, remember, you, a year from now, you can look back and you say, you know what, in that situation, Paul's going to tell us not to complain or grumble. You know, I really would have chosen to grumble and complain. In that moment, you, re- you realize that? Thank God for his grace in your life. Thank him for his enabling grace to say, God, you're, you're working in me. Like you're fulfilling what you said in Philippians 1 6, that you will bring to completion what you started. And God, you're doing it. I think, I think sometimes we're, we're a lot harder on ourselves sometimes than we are celebrating the fact that we are growing in Christ. And so Paul is here, he's celebrating their growth. He's saying, Man, you are just as you have always obeyed. He's commending them. He said, That is good. You are growing, and that is God's grace, and it's evident in your life. And you know what? I think we should do this for one another. Hey, look, you, God's grace is evident in your life. I see it in you. God's working in you. Persevere. Stay strong. Look, to me, encouragement is motivation. Right? I mean, that's, that's, that is motivation to keep going. And so Paul is encouraging them before he commends them. Because here's the, here's the thing that we should be celebrating. We aren't what we ought to be, right? Or what we will be one day. We aren't what we ought to be and we're not what we will be one day. But by God's grace, we are not what we used to be. And we thank God for that. And just like Paul is encouraging these Philippians and struggling times, he's commending them and he's saying, look, you're, you're not who you ought to be and, and, and you're not who you're right now who you're going to be. But thank God you're not who you used to be. Man, you are, you are persevering in the faith. And so he says, let us now press on to obey more and more with defiant joy. Because he says, not only in my presence, but even in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so what does Paul, after he, com- after he commends them, what does he command them towards? Well, it's the phrase that you probably have heard before. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You see, work, work out, gives, it's active, right? And when you say, I'm going to go work out, I don't think you're going to go sit on the couch. That's my kind of working out, right? Right? I mean, if if you say, I'm going to go work out, we know that, hey, this is something that you're going to to do. It's very active. And so Paul is saying, work out. It it means as Christians, we don't don't, um, passively grow. We don't passively coast along in our Christian journey. 
You see, discipleship is the lifelong journey of obedience. As Eugene Peterson says, it's, it's the same obedience and in, in long obedience in the same direction, he says. Long obedience in the same direction. Work out, he says. So what does this mean? It means to simply follow the example of Jesus. It means to live out your salvation, not earn it. You see, Paul isn't telling them, hey, you need to work to earn God's salvation. No, he's saying you need to work out what God is working in you. You need to live out the salvation that now you have in Christ. You see, we we are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace alone. right? But that faith in us also works. I mean, read James. Faith without works is what? It's dead. And so our saving faith should be seen as working out how it plays out in our life. And so Paul is saying, no, don't work out. Apply the salvation that you already have. You're not earning it. I mean, Paul, is, he's the one that, if you read anything in Romans or Ephesians, it's talking about you're saved by grace, and this is not of yourself so that you can boast. But he says also, but James also tells us that faith alone or, or faith without works is dead. And so it means to simply follow the example of Jesus. It means to live out your salvation, not earn it. Because in the Christ hymn from last week that Pastor Garen showed us, Jesus has given us the pattern for obedience. See, Paul is calling them to obedience. Work out what God is working in you. Be obedient to Christ. But we see that in Jesus first, don't we? So then what is discipleship? If Paul is saying this is the example of obedience, humility, obedient, Jesus was obedient even to the point of death. And so if Jesus is the example of our obedience, then discipleship then can be defined as becoming like Jesus. That's discipleship. That's the life of a Christian. That's the life of of someone who is following Jesus. I don't just want to know the things that Jesus knew. I want to do the things that Jesus did. I mean, when people follow Jesus as Talmads, when you you would follow a rabbi, the greatest thing you could be told was the dust of your rabbi is all over you. They weren't saying, like, you're dirty and you need to go take a bath. It's, man, you, you talk like him, you interact with people like him, you treat others like him. And so listen, church, the goal isn't just to have a lot of knowledge. It's to allow that knowledge to transform what we do. So it's not enough just to know the things that Jesus knew. As disciples, we want to become like him, so we want to do the things that Jesus did. And that's what Paul is calling us to, discipleship. Listen, you never graduate from discipleship here on this side of heaven. You should constantly be working out what God is working in you. Constantly, every single day. So what do you do when you see that it's, oh, I'm becoming this area? You celebrate that. But you constantly work out what God is working in you. And so discipleship is becoming more like Jesus. And see, let me ask you a question. Does your life look like Philippians 2, 6 through 8 that we saw last week? Are you praying and striving for growth and humility? But humility doesn't happen by accident. So if you're working out what God is working in you, you need to say, God, make me humble. We're naturally prideful people. Right? What's the middle letter in sin? Ah. It's about us. It's about me. It's about what I want. And so we need to be praying towards striving for growth and humility. Are, are, you, are you striving in personal holiness? Or are you being set apart? You know what makes you holy? Jesus prayed it. The word of God. He said, sanctify them with your word. Your word is truth. And so listen, if we're not spending time in the word, then we don't take personal holiness serious. And so are we, are we striving for personal holiness? Are we, do we have selfless service? And are we sacrificial? Are we on sacrificial mission by the power of God's enabling grace? And listen, here's the deal about Christ-likeness, discipleship, working out what God is working in you. There is no shortcut, right? There is no shortcut. You know, when you put your, your where you want to go, um, your point of destination, and Siri sometimes will give you a shortcut, right? And like, who picks the long route? You know We're like, no, I want the shortcut. I want the shortest route possible. But no, there is no shortcuts to Christ's likeness. 
It's a daily taking up your cross to follow him in the footsteps of Jesus. It's a daily thing that you choose to do every day. And here's, here's the hard part with the society that we live in, right? I want to take the shortest route. And I do that too. Like, I, yeah, we, it's just common knowledge. We want to take the shortest route to get there. But here's the thing. We, we live in a fast-paced, fast food, microwave, Google culture, don't we? Everything's at our fingertips. We get things so quick. Right? Amazon Prime, two days. If it gets here in three, somebody's getting an email. Right? I mean, if I'm in line at Chick-fil-A more than a minute, Chick-fil-A, you're, you're, you're struggling. And see, I don't get it. You can see a car is like miles long. And you think, man, i got a few minutes to think what I want. I mean, it's not really. It's chicken sandwich or chicken. I mean, but and that's probably why they go so fast. But man, these people are, I mean, they're walking with tablets. Right? I'm, I'm so fast-paced. We want things quick. But listen, growth in Christ-likeness is a slow, gradual process that you choose to en- endure every day. It's more like a, um, like a crock pot than a microwave. All right, we're, we're, we're in the, the crock pot of life, and the Holy Spirit is slowly working on us. And see, therein lies the tension that I think we live in. We know where we are, and we know where we want to be. And we're just not there yet. But you know what, you've, you know what you, it fills the gap? God's grace. God's grace. So you celebrate where you've come from, but you, in God's grace-driven effort, you drive to, you, you, you focus with every mound of your being and you strive to work out what God is working in you. It's, it's, it's active. Right? We're not just sitting on our hands trying to grow like Christ. We are actively following Him. And as we actively follow Him, He begins to make us more like Christ. And so let me ask you this. Are you committed to the daily grind of working out your salvation? Eli tells me, now he's listening. Uh, He's like, Dad, I want to play for the University of Tennessee. I'm like, buddy, that's a a big goal. You can do it. But it starts now. Now You don't just wake up one day and you play for that prestigious of a university. But it takes work and effort, guys. It takes work and effort. But it's grace-driven effort, amen? Grace-driven effort. Fill those gaps to where you see where you are and where you want to be with God's grace. And so this means we work out what God is working in us. God, and here's the thing. God will not ask you to do, to do anything that he's not going to enable you by his grace to do in you. Paul gives us good news here. So if we're going to work out what he's working in, he says, he says, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Man, when I read that and I say, thank God. I, I need him to work in me. I need him to do it. Because if he doesn't, man, I'm in trouble. But Paul says, hey, I got good news. You, you work out what he's working in you, but God's going to be the one to do it. So God will not ask you to do anything that he's not going to enable you by his grace to do. He's not going to do it. He's not going to ask you to to, to do anything that he's not, by his grace, going to enable you to do. Will it be too hard for you? Yes. But is it too hard for him in you? No. And so you you trust in his power within you. You trust in his grace to see where you are and where you want to be. And you strive towards that. Work out what God is working in you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.10, he says... But by God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not ineffective. However, I worked, hey, listen, I worked more than any of them. So Paul said, I didn't just sit on my hands. He says, I am where I am because of the grace of God. But he says, I'm also here because I I had effort. I strived. He said, I worked harder than any of them. But then he goes on to say, yet not I, but God's grace that was in me. So this is the comforting truth for us who are struggling or discouraged in our Christian growth. Just like Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, underneath our work is God's work. Underneath all our effort and, and, our, and our striving to be like Christ, underneath it all is, is God's work. It's kind of like when you make a smoothie, right? You put the fruit in there, 
And if you want to be extra healthy, you put the spinach in there, right? Maybe some milk or yogurt, and you want to get it real creamy. You put it in there. But eventually, you've, you've done all you can do. Eventually, you've got to plug it in and push the on button, and then the blender does the rest of the work. Guys, listen, you, you do what you can do, but underneath that, God is working. He's working. In, by his grace, he is growing you. And so Paul is connecting God's work and our work. We have a job, and he has a job, but he's working underneath everything that we're doing. Grace-driven effort. And then the next thing he talks about, he connects. So the first thing is God's work and our work. That's discipleship. And then the next thing he, he connects with discipleship is complaining and shining. He says, do everything without grumbling and, and arguing. Okay, when I read this, I was like, God, I'm not fit to preach this. Because like the undertone of humanity and the undercurrent of humanity is what? Grumbling. Murmuring. Complaining and arguing. But then he goes on to say, so that you may be blameless and pure, ch- children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world, by holding firm to the word of life. And then I can boast in the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Paul is saying when you work out what God is working in you, you look different than the world you live in. You just do. You stand out. He says you shine like stars in the world. This is what it means to practically work out what God is working in you. So he's going to get a little practical here. Your heart changes from a heart of discontent. That's, what, that's, why, we, that's why we grumble, right? And so he says your heart changes from a heart of discontent and sin to content in Christ. From choosing to grumble to choosing to be grateful. That's what he said. You see, Paul prefaces this command with do everything without grumbling and arguing. This means everything. Live all of life without grumbling. That's hard, ain't it? Live all of life without complaining about anything. And you're thinking, Paul, why did you have to write that? Why did you have to put do everything? He said do everything. And so we're asking, do everything without grumbling? Is that what Paul really meant? Well, let me study the Greek and see what everything means. You'll come to find out that it means everything. He says do everything without grumbling. Yes, all things. Receive criticism without grumbling. Go to the DMV without grumbling. Host house guests without grumbling. Disciple your children without grumbling. Change a flat tire on the side of the road without grumbling. Wake up and go to work without grumbling. Do everything else without one grumbling word, Paul tells us. I think it will help us if we define what really grumbling is. When we think about it and we look at the Israelites in number 11, Numbers 11 and then Deuteronomy 32, what do we see? What, what do they teach us? The grumbling people in the wilderness. After God had saved them from slavery, what do, we teach? What do they teach us? They teach us that grumbling is a discontent heart made audible. Grumbling is a discontent heart made audible. It's discontentment that you can hear. It's a discontent heart that speaks. You see, grumbling, though, if we're thinking about discontentment, you see, we grumble because we're discontent. We're not happy with our current circumstance. We're not happy with where we are. We thought we would be somewhere else or we thought something else would happen to us or we thought we would receive something that we thought we should have received or we don't have something that we think we should have. We're discontent. We are not content. And so therefore, our discontent heart is, turns into grumbling, audible complaining. And I don't have what I think I should have and I'm not where I, th- I think I should be. And so... Grumbling is a discontent heart made audible. But I think grumbling is more than that, though. It's, the, it's, it's more than just the voice of discontentment, though, guys. It's, it's also, if you want to go deeper, so, so what we, Jesus said, the, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so if, if grumbling then comes from a discontent heart, where does discontentment come from? Discontentment comes from unbelief. We grumble 
when our faith in God's purposes falter. Unwilling to trust that God is crafting this disappointment and the season for our good. We only have eyes for the painful now. We're not living with a long view in mind, what God could be doing. We, we, we forget Romans 8.28 that says, He is working all things for the good, for those who, who, who He loves and are called according to His purpose. But you know what? God gets to define that good. We don't. And so even, even then, He's working. But really, if discontentment, if, if grumbling is a heart of discontentment, then the discontentment comes from disbelief in God's ability to do what he said he was going to do. I mean, you look at Numbers 11. They were complaining about food. The Israelites were. And you know what, you know what the scripture says? It says that his, his anger burned against them. Deut- Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 5. You know where Paul gets the, um, that you will be, you'll shine like stars in a crooked and perverse generation. That was, he's echoing what is said in Deuteronomy 32 verse 5. That's what was said. They were they were a crooked generation. You know where that, came, that crooked generation came from? It came from complaining and, and unbelief that God was going to do what he said he was going to do for them. And see, here's the thing. We grumble because we, we have diligently listened to a voice other than the Lord, our God's voice. And we have begun to repeat those words. Instead of crying out to God in those moments of disappointment and in those moments of hardship, instead of crying out and saying, God, help me to trust that you are good even when this situation is not good. Help me to trust that you are good when things don't turn out the way that I want them to turn out. So instead of crying out to that, we listen to this inner voice and we begin to complain and grumble. And our grumbling and our complaining is the equivalent of saying, God, your ways are not good. It's unbelief. Some way, somehow, we we have believed the lie that God is not good and he's not working this thing, this disappointment, this hurt, this hardship out for our good. And so therefore we get discontent and then what comes out of our mouth is complaining and grumbling. And so here's the question then. The question is not, will you be tempted to grumble and complain? Because remember, the the undercurrent of our culture is complain. You don't like it, complain. You, 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 not going your way, complain. Grumble. Argue. See, if, if grumbling is a heart of discontent, then, then arguing means we, don't, we disagree. So Paul says, so the question isn't not to ask if you'll be tempted to grumble or complain. You will be tempted to complain by others since grumbling is the common language of our culture. So a better question is then how can you maintain a joyful attitude in the face of these problems? How can you do everything that Paul says without grumbling or complaining? Paul tells us, he says, by holding firm to the word of life. He says, hold hold firm, proclaim scripture. You see, you're, you maintain a joyful attitude through proclaiming the word of life. You proclaim a better word, that's what he said. What is that better word? It's God's word. And so of, instead of complaining, you maintain a joyful attitude through proclaiming the word of life. How do we do that? Well, Paul says in Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of God dwell richly within you. Listen, that's why I tell you, get in the word until the word gets into you. The goal when you read this is to get it into your sinful heart. Because in those moments where it doesn't go the way you want it to go, life sends a curveball. And so instead of the the reaction to grumble, you say, God is good and I don't understand it. And that's what makes him God. And I don't get it, but God, help me to see and to trust you that you're working this out for my good. And so Paul says the answer is by holding firm to the word of God, to the word of life, he says. And so the word of Christ speaks a better word. In Christ, listen, in Christ you have been given more than you truly deserve. We are so blessed. So blessed and And man, when I live in light of that, when I live with the terrible fate that Christ saved me from, the wrath of God, that alone, if he does nothing else for me, that alone is enough for me to rejoice in all circumstances. That salvation, rescued from the wrath of God in Christ, that alone is, God, thank you. 
Like you, you don't have to do anything else that's good for me, but you do because you're a gracious God and a merciful God and everything that I have comes from your good hand. And so God, thank you for being a God who blesses me. And then when you live with everything that you have and you realize that Scripture says that all good things come from above, every perfect and good gift comes from above, man, I'm blessed. You sing with Cain, I'm so blessed. Hallelujah, I'm blessed. In that song, he says, whether it's your worst day, your best day, your birthday, or some Tuesday, <laughs> I'm so blessed. Man, because let's think about our week. Me and Gary were talking about this. Let's think about your week for a minute. Monday's pretty rough. I, this past Monday was pretty rough for me. I texted Amy, a ministry assistant, and I said, Amy, I'm going I'm to be in just a little bit. It's, it's been a Monday. And so when you say it's been a Monday, people know, oh, it's been hard. I get it. And then Tuesday is like, oh, you're just, cover, you're just bringing along the frustration from Monday, right? And you just carry it over to Tuesday. And then Wednesday's come, you're, you're pulling your hair out and say, What's happening? And then th- Thursday comes, and, it's, and then you can look forward to the weekend. And, and so we're blessed, guys, more than we deserve. This right here is a, what you're doing and what you're partaking in is a blessing. Have we thanked God for it? God, thank you for this. Thank you for the ability to sing the doxology with faithful believers in Christ and to remind me that what we're doing is eternal. And it matters. God, thank you. You see, you know, how you, you, you know how you quickly resolve grumbling when you go to grumble? Gratefulness. Be grateful. Be content with where you are in, in, in Christ and where, and where he has you. He's working it out for your good. And so through this, Paul says, you will shine like stars in a dark world. You know what that means? In a world full of grumblers. In a world full of grumblers, non-grumblers are a very peculiar people. Man, when when the outset of everybody around you is grumbling and complaining and you respond with, God, help me to trust that you are good. God's good. I'm blessed. He's working this out. He's alive. He's sitting on the throne. He has all authority in this age and the age to come. Things may not be good, but in reality, it is good. He's good. And so Paul says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. And then lastly, he connects sacrifice with rejoicing. And see, these are, this is what's hard. Sacrifice, empty yourself for others, but rejoice when you do it. Because he says, but even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also rejoice and be glad and rejoice with me. You see, just like Jesus emptied himself, Paul is glad to to pour out himself for the glory of God. Pour out himself, empty himself, but not for himself, but for the benefit of others. It goes back to what he says in Philippians 2. He says, not only think of your own interests, but think of the interest of others. Sacrificial service. So the, the outworking of what God is doing in you should, should, should show itself in you pouring yourself out for other people. You see, when you're able to gladly empty yourself for others and rejoice because of it, this is a mark of growth in Christ-likeness. You're never more like Christ than when you're emptying yourself for the sake of others. When you, when you don't see that phone call from a friend who needs a conversation and be encouraged as, oh, again, Man, I just sat down. This is an opportunity for me to empty myself and to be more like Christ. And so rejoice in those moments. Rejoice that that God wants to use you to empty himself. See, following this example, we should be willing to pour out our lives in service with joy. And so Paul gives us an amazing picture of rejoicing through trying times. So how can we rejoice? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is worth it. Jesus will bring to completion what he began. In Jesus and through Jesus, we are doing better than we deserve. And so what is Paul telling us? Root your joy in the resurrected Jesus. So Paul is telling us discipleship, this long journey. What is it? There's God's work and there's your your work. You work out what God is working in. 
underneath everything you do is the grace of God empowering you to go and to persevere. Right? But it, it plays itself in how we talk, how we present ourselves. Right? To be different or to make a difference, you've got to be different. It's a world full of grumblers. A non-grumbler is a very peculiar person where they, they choose to rejoice. And then Paul says, and because of that, pour yourself out. Pour yourself out for the sake of Christ. Pour yourself out for the service of others. I want to end this way. Paul says, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. You know what I love about Paul? Paul was always living with a long view in mind. He was always living with eternity in mind. Why endure difficulty with a grateful heart without grumbling or arguing? That's the question we're asking. Why do that? Because Jesus is coming back. You see, we often live our life with short-sighted goals. But see, here's the deal. Paul knew that only one who mattered would one day evaluate his work. As Phil and the team come up, this past Wednesday with our Wednesday crew, and we have a good time. If you're not here for our Bible study and prayer, it is, it is a sweet time of prayer and encouragement. Remember, you've been through Monday, you've been through Tuesday. Wednesday is that good pick-me-up. But what we do, we go through our Bible reading plan, and we're in 1 Thessalonians where Jesus is talking to a church who was struggling. They were complaining, and they were grumbling. And you know what they were complaining and grumbling about? Paul, it's hard. Have we missed the day of the Lord? Has he already come And all these hardships that we're facing? Does it mean that he's already come and we, we were left behind somehow? And if he hasn't, then when is he coming back? Paul tells him, he says, you don't need to be right wrote to again about times and seasons you know what Paul doesn't give them a time and date here's why you know if we had a time and date when Jesus was coming back two things one if we knew that it was many generations before us we would live with indifference we wouldn't work out what God has worked in us we would just be indifferent we would have no motivation well it's not my generation I'll be okay and then also if we knew that it was just a few short weeks away be widespread panic and so if you have an indifferent church, you have, you have a church who, doesn't lack, who lacks motivation. No motivation to work out what God is working in. But if you have a, a panicked church, you don't have a peaceful church who says, it's good, he's in control. He's come, I don't know when he's coming back, but he's coming back. And here's the deal. Hebrews tells us we can't hide from it. And so I need to let this day or that day impact this day. And so tomorrow when you wake up, choose to rejoice and choose to say, you know what? Jesus is on his throne. Listen, preach that to yourself. This past year, that has been a, a truth that I have wanted to embed in my heart and it has worked. You know what? Jesus is alive and he's coming back. He has all authority in this age and the age to come. So what do I have to complain about? What do I have to grumble about? Yes, life is hard. But Jesus is alive. And if Jesus is alive, then we're going to be okay. Work out what he's worked in you with rejoicing. Don't grumble. Live, shine like stars. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that your word gives us life and purpose and meaning. And, and also it brings along some challenges because, God, we see where you want us. But God, we're not there yet. And so, Father, I pray that your grace uh, would, would just be tangible in this room. And this altar would be filled with people saying, Lord, forgive me for complaining. Forgive me for grumbling and arguing and being discontent and, and having an unbelieving spirit, God, that you're going to do what you said you're going to do. So, God, I want to trust you at your word. God, may we leave here shining like stars because we choose to not complain. We choose to rejoice because Jesus is alive and coming back. We pray this in his name. Amen. Hey, church, would you stand? And we want to ask that you would respond to God's word this morning. Pastor Garen and I will be up front. At the end of service, we'll also have some encouragers in the foyer for you to pray with. Church, I ask that you would respond to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Are you hurting and broken within? Jesus
contentment through Christ. And so thank you, Pastor Brandon, for that reminder. Uh, as we uh, dismiss our Sunday school classes and our mission field, just want to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, we have our quarterly business meeting this coming Wednesday the 19th. Um, that will happen before everything gets kicked off uh, on Wednesday. Um, also, uh, we have one service on the 30th. Uh, that's that's uh, a lot going on that day. We have one service that morning, so Sunday school at 930. Uh, we'll have our worship gathering at 1045, and then that night we have a, a missions opportunity that I love missions opportunity that includes corn dogs. Uh, so our fall festival is that night. So uh, we anticipate being able to connect uh, with literally uh, over a thousand people um, here in the community. So this is a tremendous opportunity, not just to have a good night of fun and trunk or treat and lots and lots of corn dogs, uh, but also uh, to live out what it looks like to be on mission, to be a missional outpost here in our community. Um, so that will be uh, from 5 to 7. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, before Allie comes with, a, with an important announcement, uh, we have a parenting conference coming up in November. Uh, Kurt Hale will uh, be our speaker. He's been in uh, family ministry for years. Uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, so you can register online. Meals are provided. Child care is provided. And so we want uh, to encourage and equip our families. Um, and lastly, uh, we have an exciting opportunity for the ladies of our church uh, that Allie is going to tell you about. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to personally invite the ladies of our church. We've been um, trying to decide what we can do just to get together and encourage each other. So what better way than, you know, you don't have to cook and you can drop your kids off and you can come be encouraged um, by some ladies' stories in our church. Um, we all need, we're all just, try, I mean, we're trying to persevere together. So I, um, I just wanted to in, invite you now so you can mark your calendars because I have to mark mine way in advance. But um, I'm giving you a month. I hope that's enough advance. November 15th, it's going to be at 6 o'clock in the Family Life Center. And um, if you could do me a favor, either register online um, or you can register in the foyer or in the hub just by writing your name down. You don't have to do both, just one or the other, whichever is easier for you. Um, but ladies of all ages, this is not just for mamas. This is not just for um, senior adults. This is for all ladies, okay? Um, single to married whatever we just want to encourage each other and um, just have a good night of fellowship so please come and um, I hope to see you there
Thank you, Allie. We're uh, so excited about so many opportunities here at Wade. Um, and uh, as I say, every Sunday, we uh, cherish the opportunity to worship with you all as a church family. Let me pray for us, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this encouragement uh, to persevere, and not for the sake of perseverance alone, but, Father, for the sake of Christ, because you empower us and you encourage us. And so we thank you for that. So may we uh, walk out these doors. May we go to Sunday school. May we go out to our mission field. Uh, with this in mind, cling to that truth that, that we are encouraged and empowered through Christ. So I uh, pray that you'd use us uh, today and this week for the sake of the kingdom. Uh, and Father, we just, uh, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. And Father, we thank you for, for the hope of heaven. We love you. We praise you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.